Thanks. Um, who of you knows Haskell's Servant, the library? Okay, a few of you. Um, for everybody not knowing it, um, it's a library where you can define a web API as a type and it de uh, derives uh, client and servers for you. Um, I didn't know it uh, a couple, or I didn't also didn't know it a, until a couple of weeks ago when a colleague of mine introduced it in the, to a pet project we are working with, we are working on at the time, and my picture is gone again. Um, and I saw it and I was immediately hooked because it reduces the code you have to write uh, to to create a client or server to a mere type. It has extra type safety to your code, and you can use this web API types as kind of contracts between your server and the uh, and the clients. And while working with this library, uh, an idea formed uh, in the back of my head, like. This would be a pretty nice pet project to bring uh, servants functionality to Scala. But what is the first thing you do before you start uh, this kind of new time sync in your private life? Right. You fire up your favorite browser and you start an extensive five minute Google search to find or try to find already available solutions. Um, fortunately for me, I couldn't find anything promising for Scala. Uh, which basically meant cancel all my weekend plans. I have no new point on my agenda. And that is bringing Haskell's uh, servant to Scala. Um, um, but I wanted to make kind of baby steps. So first thing I wanted to do is to, uh, create a way to define uh, a single API as type and derive a client function from it. And this is also the topic of this talk. Um, as already said, my name is Paul Heimann. I, I work as data engineer at the social network Sing, and we are working hard to keep LinkedIn at bay at least. If, and I'm your guide for the next, I don't know, 12 minutes or so. I don't know what's left. Um, okay, so uh, I will use this as an example during the talk to try to ease the understanding of the code, you will see. What we try to achieve here is that we fetch all users with a given name and a minimum age. And what we want to end up with is a function which, and it's gone again, a function which takes a name and the minimum age as input and returns us with a list of users. Um, yeah, hopefully this will be back in a couple of seconds. Um, okay, so the first thing you have to do is somehow describe our API as a type. Um, and we will start with the path elements. Um, here we have, or yeah, you don't see it, but we have uh, the user's path element, and this is a string. Unfortunately, we are uh, right now, or we don't have literal types in vanilla Scala, so we have to somehow uh, work around that problem, and the best solution we have right now is shapeless witness. This way, oh, it's back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this way, we can uh, somehow simulate these literal types uh, in vanilla Scala. So what we do, we derive a witness for our string users, which is part of the path we described before, and we create another type path to tag it as okay, this literal type is a path element. Then we have to move the segment onto the type level. Uh, here we have to encode two informations, the name of the segment, in this case it was just name, and the uh, type of the value we want to pass, it was a string. Um, we again use the witness to derive a literal type for the symbol, and then we put it together into uh, a new type we just call segment, the segment type. So. That's why we also move that on the type level, this information. Um, we do the same thing for the query. So we reuse the technique for the queries. We derive a witness for the symbol and then create a new type, which we just call query. And we create some types for the methods we want to use. Right now, we just have an example for a get method, but usually you also have something like a post and a put and a delete and patch and whatnot. So, okay, we have all that, but I mean, nobody wants to write this all the time, you know, so otherwise you have to all the, all the time have to write the witnesses on your own. So we wrap it up in a nice function, um, which does that for us, and it's gone again. Um, uh, what we do there, maybe you could see it for this half a second it was up there. Um, what we do is, uh, this function derives the witnesses for you and stores all this information in an, in an ageless type. But as we said, we just want to work with types, so we don't store actually 
the age list, the value level age list, but just a type. And uh, I do this by introducing this kind of, I just called a type carrier. So this is a case class without fields, without methods. It just has a type parameter, and there we store this type, uh, this age list type with all the information of our API. That's the way we can represent our API as type in Scala right now. Um, now that we are able to encode our API this way, we have to go the next step and derive a function from it, uh, or a client function. Um, the first thing is, or the first step I did is to transform it into a new representation, because to work with that is kind of hard and I need is a different representation of the API to derive the function. So the first thing I needed was to say, okay, I need all the input key types and input value types as separate age lists. I need the output type, so what I expect in the end. I need the method as a type, or the method type, and I need a list of all the elements which are in my API. Uh, for example, that would look something like that. So the input key types are the name symbol type or the witness from that and the min age and the corresponding types. So I, the name is, should be a string and it's gone again. And the min age should be an integer. Um, uh, the method is a get call, the output as said is a list of users, and the elements are this uh, user's witness or the path element witness, and some indication that we expect a segment here, a segment input and a query input. Uh, you will see the reason why I did it later on, so this comes handy uh, later on when you derive the function. Um, but when you, or let's go back, when you want to transform the shape of a collection on the value level, you usually use faults for that. So, but we are right now just on the type level. We just have a type of an age list. So, how do you fault over a type of an age list? I couldn't find a way, so I had to implement that on my own. Um, first step is you have to define how to aggregate two types into a new one, which basically gives me so I have to I have a type level function where you say I have two input types and this is, I have an expected output type. That's the aggregated or merged version. Um, you can see here an example for the query part where I say, okay, I expect a query element with a key or a name for the query and the value type and I, and I have a current aggregate. This is, in this case, it's a table where I say I have this element age list, I have the input keys, input value types, the method and the output. And what I do is I say, okay, I add a query input to query input to the elements. I say um, I add the key to the input key types, the value type to the value input types, and I don't change the method and output because they are not uh, they are not related to the query itself. Um, and I have to implement the functions for all the different elements I have. So I have to implement it for the path. I have to implement it for the segment and method. Now that I know how to merge or aggregate types, um, I have to go over my API type and to transform the whole API. Therefore, I have to cre create a recursive call structure on the type level. What I do here is, in a fall case, I look at the current element in my API or a current type. I try to de derive um, this aggregation function. When I find one, um, I get a new intermediate aggregated type and I pass this on to the next stage of this recursive call structure. And in the end, if no elements in my API are left, I just return the uh, folder or the new, or the latest aggregated type. That's why I'm able to take this API type I created before with my function call and this, into this new representation of, of this uh, tuple of multiple types. Now that I'm able to do that, um, the next step is to collect all the necessary, uh, all the data necessary to actually do a request. Um, so, for example, here we just need the URI, so the endpoint we want to call, and the map of queries um, we have. In this case, it's just one query, but could be uh, multiple. And we want to derive a function which gets the input values and returns us this URI and the queries. Um, and 
I also created a type class for that and gave it, gave it the name request data builder. Might be not the best name, but doesn't matter. And what it does is it provides a function which gets the input values. Uh, in this case, uh, the segment name and oh, way out of time. Segment name and the query uh, input and generates the URI and queries on the fly. We again have an example for queries or for a query here. What we do is we derive again the witness for the key and uh, take the name from the witness and put it together with the value we got here uh, into our queries map. So we update the queries map and it's gone again. And then we go into the next step of our uh, builder, which is again a recursive call structure and um, extract all the informations. What we get is there a kind of a nested call structure, a function call structure, which generates all, the, all this information we need to do a call. So what we got so far is we, uh, we can derive a function which takes an age list, for example, here for a name and a minimum age, and we get back all the information we need for a, risk, uh, for, for a request. Now we actually have to do the request, and what we can do here, or what I did here, is create another type class which um, abstracts away how we do this in the back end. So you can use HTV4S or Play or whatnot to actually do the request. You just pass all the information, the request is done, and you get the results back in some context F. Um, if you wrap it up, then we transform our API, we uh, extract all the request data, and we do the actual request. So it looks something like this. We can pass the age list and get back some I.O., for example, or future of our expected result. This is not really nice because we have to construct the age list every time, or we have to construct an age list to call this function. But in Shapeless, we have a kind of a nifty feature, which is called function from product, where you can pass a function with get, which gets an age list and returns some output, and it returns you or produces you a function which gets or has a parameter list where the parameters are equal to the elements of the age list or types of age list, so that we can transform this to a function call where, where we expect a name and a minimum age and get the results or the, the expected output in the end. So after this sprint, you are able to derive a, a client function call from a type, and you are able to build the type. Um, I'm also invested the time to uh, do some more stuff, and I put this into the library typed API, and you all you get what I described here. You can derive um, a function from API and do a call there. Um, you also can uh, derive a server function from that, and it's gone again um, from the same API. Um, maybe this comes back. I you are so far. We you just saw to or you just saw the way how uh, to derive um, an, uh, a function call or a client function from a single API. I also implemented a way to do it for multiple APIs. So can you so you can compose multiple API types into a single one and derive multiple functions from it, or derive a server with multiple endpoints from it. Um, I also added the uh, Hess Servant DSL, so everyone who wants to write it the uh, server Haskell style can also use uh, uh, this DSL. And uh, right now it supports HTTP 4 as, as backend. Um, what is next steps is to clean up the code because it doesn't look like that. It's more like work in progress, I would call it. Um, also, I want to add support for AKHTP and Finnegal, and there's talk about deriving Swagger documentation just from type because you have most of the information you need there. Um, so I'm done with my slides. I think time is out, and thank you. Questions? <laughs> now the microphone. Did you look at Row? Uh, did you get a chance to look at uh, Row, the library on top of HTTP for us? Uh, didn't hear or didn't. No, no, I didn't hear of it or heard of it. But again, I, my search was not that um, I extensive. Yeah, I don't think they generate the clients yet, but they had a little bit of the DSL bid, and they already generate the Swagger doc from uh, from the mm. query structure. 
Yeah, you know, that's what was more like I saw my um, colleague of mine showed me Surf and I was like, okay, that would be really nice as a project. And I just Googled for five minutes or so and couldn't find anything on the first page and was like, okay, nothing there. I can build it on my own. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Maybe do we have questions in the back? I feel like it's... Okay, then uh, we can... There was a question here and... Um, can you say something about how it affects compile times? A lot. Hmm? A lot. A lot. I mean, um, you have some heavy, I would say heavy uh, type level computation there. I think I created some API with 10 endpoints and it took three seconds or so to compile. So if you have something bigger or larger, I would say you can end up with five or 10 seconds, something like this. But usually for the client side, that's not that bad because you just write it once, compile it once. And if you have the incremental compile, it should be okay. For the server side, it could be, um, the penalty could be bigger because you have to recompile it every time you change something in a function or so. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, plans to add support for a client and uh, ScalaJS as a client? Any IAX calls? Um, so to to uh, make this library work for ScalaJS, you mean? Um, I have no plan, basically because I have um, no experience with the ScalaJS part of Scala. So I didn't thought about it, but usually it shouldn't be a problem because it's independent of any uh, I.O. implementation. Any more questions? Okay, then um, we're gonna have a short break now until 3.30. You can grab some coffee and um, be back for the next session. Let's thank Paul again.